In the last two videos, I showed how two keys were better than one, but three keys were better than two. In this video, I'm going to be showing you what we can do with no keys at all. Hello, I'm Philip Ann Baker, and in this video, I'm going to be showing you uniform data fingerprint. What is it? Well, it's started off as being simply a refresh on the old PGP fingerprint. PGP fingerprints are really, really good. I like them a lot. The only problems that I had with the existing format was it was using an obsolete algorithm, SHA-1, that you know, we no longer think is secure, so we try and get rid of it. They don't support algorithm agility. So it's difficult to introduce a new open PGP fingerprint format without being subject to a downgrade attack. So it's difficult to get more security out of it. And they're only supported for use within open PGP. They're only designed for signing keys. And that means that if you try and repurpose them for other purposes, like I want to do in the mesh, it leaves you open to a semantic substitution attack. So UDF began as an improved fingerprint. You know, let's start off, let's use base 32 instead of hexadecimal, which gives us an extra bit per character without having to distinguish upper and lower case. Uh, if you want to read something out on the phone, base 64 is really tedious because you've got to say small a, big A each time. So base32 is the one to go for. We add a digest identifier which gives us the algorithm agility while preventing that downgrade attack and we incorporate the content type into the digest value as I'll show and that prevents the semantic substitution attack. So let's start off and see what the original UDF uh, idea was. Okay, so we wanted a compact presentation. So we wanted to have something that we could read out. So let so M B five S dash R four A J. So see that they're grouped in units of four. Uh, that's to improve usability. It doesn't necessarily have to be four characters, it could be five, it could be six even. It needs to be between four and seven. Uh, the reason why we've chosen four is that makes some other stuff uh, easier down the line. Um, okay, so we've got 40 characters, so we need to go on a bit further. Sorry, 30 bits. F-B-T dash. Okay, so there we've got 80 bits, which is of fingerprint, which is really the absolute minimum strength that you could use for a fingerprint format. Now, the thing about uh, UDF is that, as I sh will show you, it's variable length. We can choose the number of bits that we present, the precision of the presentation independently of the algorithm. So under the covers here, what, what this base32 string maps to is a binary sequence, the first byte of which, so that's going to be these five bits and three bits here, the first byte of it which are a, a, a type identifier, identifying the digest algorithm that we're using. And this has been deliberately chosen so that for this particular content digest, which uses SHA-2, which is a Merkle Damgaard construction, it guarantees that the first character will not be a hexadecimal character. So we don't have confusion possible with open PGP fingerprints. And the M is just, well, Merkle Damgaard, it just, it's just a, an aid memoir. Okay. So we've got here a so we've got here a simple fingerprint. The first byte is the content identifier, and then the following bytes are the 512-bit 
output of that digest truncated to wherever we need to give the number of bytes we're using. In this case, it's we've got an eight, 80 bits of our output, minus one, that means we've got 72. That means that we've got nine bytes of significant digest in the final output. And of course, that's not really enough to be comfortable for the general case. But this one's short enough to put on your business card and hand to somebody. And in that context, well, you might type this into your computer when you get home, and then when it does the, it pulls the profile or the contact, whatever, and then having done that, it can, to check for equality, it has to calculate the full digest strength. And so then when you store that contact in your contacts directory, you're going to store not 80, 80 bits worth, not just 20 characters. You're going to be storing you know, um, 200, 240, whatever. So that's what we call digest strengthening. And it's integral to UDF that we can always use we can always use a weaker form and then strengthen it later on okay so how do we count, uh, calculate this digest value well we start off with uh, so the type code in this case is 96 which gives us an M so the UD the rest of the piece this piece this is calculated as hash of the content ID A colon and the hash of the data. Okay, so a fairly simple construction. Uh, why do we have this nested construction? Well, let's see how, let's just instantiate it here. So, say this is a piece of text, we will have this piece will be text slash play colon and then followed by the hash of the data doing the nested construction doesn't actually impact efficiency very much for the single case but let's see say that you had a document you don't know whether it was encoded as text play or text HTML you can digest the document itself once and then try each of the content types in turn and see if which content type causes the two fingerprints to match. And so it's just a bit more bit of efficiency that we get out of there digesting the two things separately. The other reason for doing it this way is that quite often you end up with the fingerprint uh, that was calculated for some other purpose, you know, for some raw, uh, s some scheme that isn't thinking about content uh, semantic substitution attacks. And this just means that you don't need to recalculate that digest. And, you know, if you've got a gigabyte, maybe even a terabyte of data, that could be problematic for you. So we have the... Uh, you know, we separate out the two and it just provides a bit more security, some more flexibility. So, Merkel Damgard will always give us an M, and for SHA-3, which is based on Kekak, the uh, first letter is always going to be a K. So you can immediately distinguish SHA-2 and SHA-3 fingerprints just by a glance, which is maybe not so useful, but why not? Right, so that's, that was the original compression scheme, and then I started to look into the Bitcoin world. And yeah, I know, Psy, Bitcoin. Okay, so the problem here is vanity addresses. And as usual, it turns out there's a scam. 
well, as usual for Bitcoin. So some people are creating vanity uh, addresses so that the first few uh, characters of their fingerprint turn out to be a recognizable, memorable word. So one boat SLR, one ninja one or whatever, which sounds harmless. Right up until you find that there's that site that will generate for you very, you know, for free, they'll generate you a public private key pair to use as your Bitcoin wallet address. And of course, the idea of using that private key to steal your money, well, that, that's the furthest thought from their minds. Okay, well, actually, if you really wanted to do this, you could use the metacryptography I described in the last uh, video, the key combination scheme. We, you could use that to have a secure way of generating a fingerprint that's pretty. And if you wanted to do that, that's definitely the way that you've got to go forward. You know, do not ever use public private key pair as your private key that somebody else generated you know, you make you've got to always make sure that you have contributed some randomness to it but I still don't like them because you see the thing is that when you're comparing for equality the first thing that you look at is you know the start of the string and your attention wanders as it goes along um, and so I, I would like these t the comparison to be as short as possible for starters. And having something really attention grabbing at the front is making this front loading even worse. So I, 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 I'm not at all keen on vanity addresses. So I was thinking, what can I do that would make this uh, more secure? And in the process, I kind of reinvented a scheme very similar to one that Christian Wietemar told me about that's used in another ITF protocol. Uh, Microsoft had a patent on that particular technique that they had gave a free license to. Obviously that wouldn't cover the mesh, but I don't think that the approach I'm going to describe infringes, but we should talk to their lawyers anyway. You know. Patents, aren't they fun? Okay, so the idea here is that type 96 tells us that we got a SHA-2 digest output. If, however, the type is 97, it tells us that the digest value you've got here was calculated by SHA-2 and that the last 20 bits of the digest the ones that normally wouldn't appear even in the longest digest, you know, n nobody's going to want more than 250 bits of digest. Um, even th those last few bits, last 20 bits, are all zero. So what that means is that now we have a fingerprint value that occupies only 80 bits that instead of telling us 72 bits of the digest value, which would be hopelessly insecure, is telling us 92 bits of the digest value, which is actually starting to become reasonably acceptable. And the cost of doing that, of course, is that we've got to try a million private public-private key pairs before we can get to one that works. And there are more efficient ways of doing it. We should be using the key blinding scheme for starters. But what we can do here is we generate, we start off with a point A and we multiply it by P and we see if the fingerprint is what we want. And if not, we add a P to it and then another P and keep trying each time and that is a way, a, very, a fairly efficient way of doing a million 
um, elliptic curve key generations without breaking the bank on performance. And so we can do 20 bits, which is about a million trials, or 30 bits, which is a billion trials. And I'm thinking that we should cap this approach at 40 bits uh, because you know, we don't want to create another Bitcoin uh, carbon uh, destroying uh, protocol. You know, it's just not necessary. So certainly, if not 40 bits, cap it at 50. Okay, so here we've got an integrity guarantee. And um, it works. Um, it's a, but as I was doing this, I was thinking, well, you know, zero key cryptography is useful. You know, this is something that you can, we can now put our public key on our business card, provided there's some way of retrieving it from storage somewhere. But you know, we can, we can deal. But. You know, zero key cryptography is useful, but I'm saying that adding a key is more useful. Well, it's more useful for other purposes. It means we can use this for other purposes. So the next UDF adds a message authentication code. So we calculate the content digest in the normal fashion. And then we calculate the map of some key material and that content value. And the key material, the OKM value, is generated originally from a unicorn, uh, sorry, sorry, a Unicode um, password. So this is a way that we can blind the keyword, the, the blind the fingerprint with respect to a password. Well, what use could this be? Well, if you've got really short pieces of content, then the fingerprint can turn out to be um, too short, if we, and we take his fingerprint on it, then you can end up in a situation where somebody can guess the data corresponding to the fingerprint simply by an exhaustive search. I mean, this is how keywords uh, passwords are broken. You, know, you don't do an exhaustive search on SHA-2, you do it on the set of possible passwords. And so adding a key there means that you can avoid that attack. And this is just a useful little building block that we can use inside a protocol. And one of the applications of this is one of the means that's used to join devices in the mesh using QR codes. I'll get on to how we, the QR code bit in the next video. For now, let's just set out the actual techniques and then application comes next. Okay, so we've got two useful integrity pre presentations. What else can we do? Well, one really useful thing turns out to be able to present a nonce value, you know, just random data. And so type 104 was, uh, which is N, um, is assigned to nonce. Oh, I should have mentioned the Mac version that has type 0, which gives us an A. So A for Mac authentication, M or K for Merkle Damgard or Kekak. Um, content digest and N for a nonce. What else can we do? Well, one of the things that came up was what can we do for encryption? And as I will show you in the next video, encryption turns out to be really dramatically useful. So type 32 was reserved for encryption you uh, using AES 512 and deriving the encryption key from the fingerprint using HMAP KDF. So we're using a key derivation function to generate our, our actual encryption keys rather than 
the value of the UDF itself. And this turns out to have a lot of use, as well as I'll explain when we get to the data at rest envelope formats. It provides us with a really convenient way of putting a shared secret out into a protocol. And so E became encryption. And then once you start to do encryption, well, you start to think about key escrow. And so the first thing, the first approach to key escrow in the mesh was, okay, we want to take our private key and we will encrypt it under a symmetric key. The content digest of that symmetric key will be the identifier of the encrypted packet and that encrypted packet can now sit there in the internet somewhere and it can only be derived, uh, obtained by somebody who can provide the right content digest uh, value. Yeah, so we, we did that. Um, but we want to be able to, we don't want to have a single point of failure. We want to be able to use key splitting on that symmetric encryption key. And so the obvious thing to do there was Shamir secret sharing. Now, I'm not going to explain Shamir secret sharing in this series, but there's another series that I'm going to be pr producing immediately after, which is an introduction to cryptography. And so I will explain Shamir secret sharing in that particular uh, presentation. So type 144, which provides an S, uh, allows us to define a Shamir secret share. And the particular approach that we've chosen in the mesh allows us to have shares of any integer multiple of 32 bits. And the shares can be N out of M. So we can have a quorum of up to 15 and up to 16 different shares, which is, you know, a pretty good number. I, I doubt that there's a practical application to go beyond there unless you're playing games like, say, well, Alice has two votes and Bob has one and Carol has four. That's the only way that you can really get up to um, requiring more than about 16 shares. So that was just a useful little bit that we added. Uh, but then folk were starting to say, well, I like the way that you can download those keys, whatever, for recovery purposes. But what I want to do is to initialize a device. And I want to move the private key by means of a QR code. And I want to be able to pull up the public key or the private key direct from an OID. And OK, so type 108 was uh, then reserved for, which is an O, uh, is reserved for an OID distinguished secret. OK, so these were starting to multiply up. So that allows you to have a UDF that communicates a public or a private key pair. Okay, so you basically use the PKIC style ASN1 code encoding of the key, you express that as a UDF, and bang, you've got a way of communicating, which is good. However, we then started revisiting the uh, key escrow scheme. And one of the concerns that was raised uh, you know, in the week that we were discussing this, somebody says, well, you know, I don't like your scheme because, you know, what you're providing for personal key escrow also works as a route for government mandated key escrow. And, you know, in the time, in the days where you've got authoritarian governments, you know, three authoritarian pseudo-democratic governments joining together a minority of popular support in every case, saying, we want to have 
your encryption keys. We want more power because the amount of power we've got today isn't enough for us. You know, we've only, you know, we've only betrayed the Kurds, screwed up Brexit and everything. Yeah. So I started thinking, how could I escrow the keys for a user so that the key user can recover those keys without having a data recovery blob out there on the net somewhere where a authoritarian government can say, I want to have access to that key because I need more power. And so the solution I came up with there is, okay, so we've got a, an encryption key. Let's have a random seed, essentially an input to a KDF function. We'll encode that as a UDF fingerprint, and now we will have type Z, so type 200, type Z, uh, UDF. It's not in the spec yet. I will update the document soon to add it. Type 0 is a private key generation function, and this is something that people can use as the basis for a recovery string for their private key set that cannot be um, obtained by anybody, but, but that cannot be modified to a government key escrow scheme without introducing a whole lot more mechanism. And again, you know, you're probably not going to want to write down your raw key as it is. You're far more likely to want to have n out of m shares, you know, 2 out of 3, 3 out of 5, uh, 3 out of 7, that sort of thing. And so that's basically uh, KDF, uh, UDF. Uh, the Z piece, uh, besides generating the keys for the mesh, is also, I think, going to be useful as a means of moving a user's SSH key from one machine to another. Because the big weakness in SSH today is it's a real hassle being able to generate, being able to move that private key. And when you start to look at all the channels that we have for moving it, quite often, which is to say, you know, once is too many, but quite often, the way that people move their keys around turns out to be in email and they don't always encrypt them well. So this gives us another way of, of enabling thing, enabling SSH, enabling PGP or whatever with a built-in recovery factor. Okay, so in this presentation I've shown you the basic UDF mechanisms and how we generate uh, base32 encoded strings of binary data that represent some cryptographic output or other. In the next one, I'm going to show you how we can put those to work in the mesh using QR codes and also DNS names. And so please stay for the next video. Please click like and please subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.